I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So welcome to the house of the Lord. It's good to be here with you. And it's good to see one of our old friends who, who, um, who's back for the first time, Richard Archer's back. Welcome back, Richard. Um, we have, um, we're going to do something different on announcements. And so let me mention that first of all. Um, we would like to have people make announcements from this lectern here. And then, so if you know you're going to make an announcement, you know, come up, come on up and get ready and be a way to, to manage them a little bit so we, we keep them, um, um, short and to, to the point and all. And there's a, there's a, there's a, a good thing with talking about things, not just reading it in the bulletin. So it's sort of like, um, to try to, um, do that and also have people have the mic so that everybody can hear it, especially in TV land. Um, I want to mention a couple things. So I'll, uh, Bible studies Tuesday night, and I have been working on that. We're going to jump up to Acts chapter 9, and, and I, I've got pictures for you that go along with the scripture, and I picked out some uh, of places that I haven't been. And so uh, Tuesday night at 7, then tonight the Lenten service at Mount Hope. And that's all that I have. So are there any other announcements from the floor? Don't be bashful. <laughs> okay, real quick, uh, worship committee. We'll have a brief meeting with the worship committee right over here, right after church. So if you would, if you're on the worship committee, please meet right over here, right after church. Anything else? Come on up. Again, please come. plan on coming to our Lenten service next Sunday at 7 o'clock. Uh, if you really want to hear our music program, I think it is uh, perhaps its fullest other than when we've done a cantata, you know, the Christmas cantata. Uh, we're doing four pieces, two for like a call to worship slash introit, and two for an anthem. Then I'm also doing a piano piece. We're doing uh, five specials, in other words. So uh, we really wanted to put our best foot forward for this community service. So we hope we'll also have good attendance from people in the congregation. So, and today's an uh, anthem, In the Garden, uh, has a little different twist to it. Normally, In the Garden is in 3-4. I come to the one, two, three, one, two, three. We're going to do it today in 4-4, four, four, just to shake it up a little. Uh, so we hope you enjoy it. Brad told me I'd be all right here at this mic since I'm over it. So anyway, the youth group um, went to Winter Jam last night, had a really good time. Wasn't a, a lot of sounding music. The words were great, but... Music wasn't for my ears, so I didn't stay in the actual Coliseum uh, very long myself. So I uh, went out and watched it on the big screen right outside. Um, but we had a really good time. One carload got back about 10.30 last night, and I think the other carload got back probably about midnight. So um, I was in the early carload. Uh, yeah. But we do have youth meet today from 3 to 4.30, and we also have the luncheon next Sunday, sponsored by the youth. If there aren't any, any other announcements, let's move into worship, and we'll, we'll begin with the uh, You Are My God, page 40 for our cho choral intro.
We have come this day to learn about what God expects of us. God is persistent. God would not let us off the hook so easily. But we have failed so many times in the past. How can we possibly serve now? Open your hearts to receive forgiveness and healing. Listen to God. Be ready to work with God for hope, peace, justice, and love. Be with us, Lord. Help us to turn around to see you, to serve you, to witness your love. Amen. Please join us in the opening hymn 503, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. Let us pray. Lord, you have assured us that when we are in you, we are a new creation. And we are continually changing as we travel along to you. So we ask that during this time, you would help us to be more like you. Open our hearts to your messages and receive our prayers and our thanksgiving during this time. Lord, you taught us to pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Um, we have Jenny and Cameron Boss today reading from the scriptures and the confessional readings. Today's reading comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 45. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. 
and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Our questions from the Heidelberg Catechism. Whence knowest thou this about our Lord Jesus Christ being our true mediator? From the Holy Gospel, which God himself first revealed in paradise, and afterwards published by the patriarchs and prophets, and represented by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law, and lastly has fulfilled it by his only begotten Son. Are all men then, as they perished in Adam, saved by Christ? No, only those who are engrafted into him and receive all of his benefits by a true faith. Thank you. Very nice. Very nice. Dr. Rob?
Thank you. Um, I would like to ask the deacons to come forward as I will read on the call to offering. So come forward while I read. Um, giving is an act of faith. We believe that what we have to, make, to offer makes a difference in this world. As we have seen in the thank yous from recent miss missionaries that have visited us. But more than that, we believe that one who is behind all our, that, that the one who is behind all our giving, um, we may not see, we may not see with our eyes what God is doing around us or even the effect of what we give, but still we believe. So I invite you now to give as an act of your faith. is hymn number 75, Holy is the Lord. Let us pray. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And Lord, we can't give you back to you what you have already given to us. We can only give you a, a token of our love and dedication to you. So please recognize these gifts and the hearts that have given them. Bless these gifts for your kingdom, for this church. And um, we pray that you would bless the hearts that have given them as well. All these things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And you may be seated um, as we have Jesse Holshauser coming forward uh, with the children for the children's message. So tell me some things that you do in the mornings when you get up. Brush your teeth, I mean, brush your teeth and get ready. Okay. Eat breakfast and get ready. Good. So you brush your teeth. You get them real good. 
make your teeth shine. Well, I'll tell you what, let's try to do something this morning that, that'll help us understand this. What's the favorite part about brushing teeth? <laughs> what is it? Get them clean. Well, she's going to hand you some stuff. I'm going to show you my toothpaste. Does yours look like this? No. no. What does yours look like? Blue? You don't use a minion? Minions are good. They get in there and just... Let me see. What else do I got here? You going to see my toothbrush? Yeah. Oh. I got one for in the morning and one for at night. So, well, this one's in the morning. It's light blue for the sunrise. You know what's <laughs> cool about these? And this is the one I use at night. Puts me to sleep. But you know what's so funny about these? You can lick the bottom of them and stick them right on the window. <laughs> you don't ever stick them on the mirror? Yeah, that's fun, isn't it? I'm not allowed to. You're not allowed to. <laughs> well, I tell you what, let's take your toothpaste, and I want you to squeeze just a little bit out. On, on the, on the uh, yeah, how, how about putting it on the uh, <laughs> plate? You, you got one of those tough ones? See how easy that was to squeeze out? We got a big one there, huh? Does it come out that easy when you squeeze it at home? Yeah. Okay. Now listen real carefully. We're not going to waste anything. I want you to put it right back in that tube. Put it back in the tube. How'd you get it out? Well, then stick it back in there. Oh. Squirt it in. Squirt it in. <laughs> is it working? No. No. Kind of hard, isn't it? Okay, let me read you a Bible story. Um, the Bible readings today, you got it all back in there? No. You ain't got nothing. <laughs> the Bible readings that we have for today talk about being careful about what we say to others. Without thinking, we can say to another person that really hurts them, right? It's kind of like you squeezing that toothpaste, and when it comes out, that tube, you can't get it back in, right? So I want you to listen to this. The very same thing is true about the words we speak. Have you ever said something that hurt somebody's feelings? I wish I could say that. Um, and heard them say, you take that back, but you can't take that back, can you? Once you have said it, it is said. You can't put the words back in your mouth. Or more than that, you can't squeeze the toothpaste back into the tube. This is why we need to be careful about the things we say. The Bible says, he who holds his tongue is wise. That's from Proverbs 10, 19. Here's another Bible verse. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That's from Psalms 19, 14. Once we have said it, we can't get it back. So let's make sure the words we say to others are pleasing to God. It just makes a mess if you take the toothpaste out of the tube and you can't put it back in, doesn't it? Saying unkind words to another person is kind of unpleasant. But we have to think about what we say before we say it, right? Why don't you try to say something that's unpleasing? Can you think of anything? No. Anything? Try it. 
Oh, trap. Got it. Weirdo. I'm trying to catch it, but I can't get it, can I? <laughs> Just like you can't take those words back, can you? See, you, when it comes out, it's out there. There's no way to get it back in. So you have to watch what you say. So tomorrow morning, when you squeeze a toothpaste out of the tube, I want you to remember the lesson. Then do your best to speak kind words to everyone that you talk to each and every day. Okay? Let's pray. Dear God, we know that our words can bless others or hurt others. We know that we can't get our words back once we have spoken them. So help us through your Holy Spirit to make sure our words are always spoken in love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, since you've been sticking your finger in that toothpaste, you can keep it. <laughs> I don't want it back. <laughs> Let me have your plates, and we'll put them in here for the trash. Trash. Yeah. yeah. Well, let us move into the time of prayer. And, you know, there are some good things that we can offer in Thanksgiving. Um, and I always ask for prayer requests. So if there's something to, to give, give thanks to, to as well, I'd like for you to mention that. But it's good to see Richard and his wife back um, after Richard's been convalescing. And then this week, um, Polly Bost will celebrate 90 years and her daughter and son-in-law are here with her today. So congratulations, buddy. But we'll, we'll give thanks to the Lord for those, those things. Um, and we were talking in Bible study about um, some different things. And we'll remember um, um, Vicki Culp and um, the... Um, oh, my goodness, help me now. The which family? The Harkey family. Okay, and are there other requests? Cindy Maxwell. Cindy Ma Maxwell? Cindy Maxwell. Okay. And any uh, thing that I can say about Cindy for the health or? Yeah. Okay. Healing. Other requests? Thank you. That's what I was, you know, I was getting one of those moments. <laughs> they happen all the time. Um, all right, anything else then? Okay. Well, let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Lord, today we will be reading some scripture where you talk about the lost son. And, you know, we're all lost in some way or of the other. Of course, for those uh, who have come to Christ, we might think that that's it, we're found. But we get lost so easily. Our journey gets filled with so many potholes along the way, and we have attitudes and sins and things that go on that we wish didn't happen. And we come to you every day. Um, and we ask that you would help us to watch with you, that we might be attentive. For you told uh, those who were sitting with you or sta with you in the garden, the, the spirit is willing, but the, weak is the, but the flesh is weak. So we, we pray, Lord, that you would help us and strengthen our spirits and help us that we might do the things that you would do, that our hearts might be really motivated for love to you, that we do these things not because we have to, but because uh, we want to. We pray that you would fill our lamps with the, the oil of faith, hope, and love. And that when you knock on the door for us, whenever that may be, our lamp is filled and burning. So, Lord, this is our prayer. And we pray for this church, that this church would be 
a vessel of all these faithful people, that it would be a faithful church. And we remember the other churches around here and throughout the world that your light might be burning in these lamps. Lord, we, um, we thank you for many blessings that you've given to us, and there's been a lot of, of good things going on at this church and, and at the parsonage, and we thank you for all those, those uh, blessings. Um, I thank you particularly for all the good things you have, have brought to me by being here in, in a, a peaceful parsonage and, and all these uh, things, repairs and improvements that have been made and it's ongoing and the church as well has had these, these good things. We celebrate these things and, and, and pray that, that you would be praised by them. We thank you for, um, for Polly Bost and, and the, the, the many years that she has been here as a faithful par parishioner and we celebrate the life that she has this week coming up with 90 years. Um, we thank you, Lord, for, um, for um, all the blessings you've given to us and that uh, Richard and, and um, Sue are back with us, that Richard's health has, has uh, improved or that, that he's had healing. And, and we know that many people, including me, have been plagued with these colds and different things going around, and we pray, Lord, that you would heal us and help us. And some people have been healed, and we rejoice, and, and we pray for your, your uh, healing of those who are not well yet. We remember Cindy Maxwell on this note, and we um, uh, lift up spe especially um, um, B. Harwood. We remember Vicki Culp. We remember the Goodson family and the Harkey family. So, Lord, be attentive to those special uh, requests. And, Lord, we um, now pause for a moment of silence for, for each person to offer a special prayer or burden to give to you. <coughs> Lord, we had many tragedies in our country again this week as, as we experience all the time. This world is dark. And so we pray for your victory um, that you have overcome the world and may that victory be more and more visible every day as we urge uh, y your kingdom to come and as we, we look forward to, to the coming of, of Jesus Christ. As, as the early church said, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. And we pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> our, our hymn of worship is number 337. Let's rise to sing nothing but the blood. <coughs>
Please be seated. And friends, the rose on the altar today is uh, a token of, of uh, joy and thanksgiving for the birth of baby Horton. And this is mentioned in the bulletin as well, right? Okay. Um, our scripture is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. <coughs> the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of, his, of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found.
Please be seated. Well, today let us talk about prodigal versus practical, heavenly versus earthly. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. We see some images of Christians in this parable that our Lord gave to us. Um, the prodigal son has one set of issues. He doesn't seem to love or seek his father, but ultimately he's found. The other son follows the rules. I mean, he might be on appearance a really good Christian, but he's filled with resentment. Both of these sons give us an earthly perspective. You know, earthly in the sense of we um, have these attitudes that we constantly deal with and we can never seem to let, let them go. And then, of course, there's the Father who gives us a heavenly perspective. And he has got the traits that we would really like to have, but um, that's part of our spiritual journey. So what we're going to do is talk about these three people, the prodigal son, uh, his brother, the practical son, and then the father. And we're going to talk about some implications for us as we journey as Christians um, through this parable this very powerful parable and moving parable. Well, prodigal, first of all, means to be lavish in spending. Um, this is the kind of behavior that's reckless or immoral. Um, it's selfish. Um, prodigal means I want something and I want it now. Uh, and it could be even something that doesn't belong to me. Now, prodigal will waste resources and squander things. And another aspect of being prodigal is it is being disobedient and disrespectful. So, you know, at, this, at the very beginning of this parable with the, the one prodigal son, that, those are all traits that may apply to that, that man at that time. Now, he would have been a Jewish man, the prodigal son. And he asks for his inheritance before his father has died. And so that carries a whole bunch of stuff with it. It's, uh, it's very selfish, number one. But it's almost like, I wish you were dead. This is what he's really saying to his father. I wish you were dead because I want, just want my money and I want it now. He's unwilling to be a part of his family and to do what they do. And it's obvious they do farming of some kind, uh, raising raising uh, livestock. Um, he takes his share and he leaves not only his family, but he leaves all of his people. He leaves his country. He goes to some other country that perhaps he picked out because it had the allure or the glitter of worldly living and all the things that he wanted to um, indulge in. So he goes into the, uh, the world to... Um, to increase his worldliness, his immoral self-indulgence. And so he does use his money for prostitutes, as his brother points out. And when the money runs out, these are lessons of the world here, he doesn't have any friends. And that is exactly what happens in the world. If you don't have money, you're out of luck. When he is in need, no one helps him. And that's also just like the world. Um, that's why, as a sidebar, we as Christians are different than the world because we'll help people who don't have money and we're there for them in their need. Um, now this, this prodigal son becomes a prostitute himself in the sense that he violates the values that he was brought up with. As a Jewish boy, he would have been taught that pigs or swine are unclean. We don't eat them, and we don't tend them. And here he is in this foreign country, and he goes and tends to pigs. So in some respects, you know, that's not a terrible thing that he does, but I think you can see his values have been eroded completely. And he's doing things that he was taught should not be. So in his need, 
we see that he comes to his senses. Now, I have debated over this passage a number of years. I've wondered, well, was this guy really sincere? And as I was preparing this message for you, I was struck by something in the Greek. And the Greek said that he went to himself. Literally, he went to himself. And I pondered that and over and over again. I think, you know, we talk about having a heart-to-heart -heart talk between two people. And I think he had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with himself. That I think he really saw who he was and who he had abandoned here. And that he might have really wanted to, to, to um, go back to his father and, um, and do exactly what he said. On the other hand, you know, you wonder, well, maybe he, he, um, he was just coming up with a story. He was really hungry, so, you know, it's sort of a debate. But I really think he hit bottom there and that he wanted to go to his father. He was broken and at the bottom, and he was, uh, was going to go back home, period. So that's it for son number one, the prodigal son. Let's switch now. We're going to come back to some of this stuff as we talk about implications. But uh, the second son, the practical son, or the obedient son, the stay-at-home son is the one whom we would call practical. He follows the rules in a practical way. And so he might be frugal and he might be obedient. He lives within his means, but he might grumble. Uh, maybe he's even greedy. There may be jealousy with him. I don't know if you picked up on that. And it's obvious as well that he is unforgiving and resentful. You know, the practical can appear to be virtuous in worldly ways, but they are really not heavenly in their hearts. The practical son or the obedient son may possibly be a symbol for those who honor God with their words and even their actions but their hearts are far from God. The practical son stays at home and he works in the family farm. You know, we might point to him as an example. Be like him. Well, when the lost son is home and the party is going on, the obedient son does not call his father father. I don't know if you noticed that. He does not call his brother brother. He is critical of of that son of yours who has squandered your money on prostitutes. Um, and while this son is obedient and faithful to his father, he resents he wasn't able to enjoy a party for himself. The joy of family is not in that man. The love of the father is not in that man either. He doesn't sound like he would do it all over again, and perhaps he's jealous that his brother had such a good time and he was stuck on the farm. The obedient son follows the rules but is filled with resentment. He hasn't done things out of love. If he had, the resentment wouldn't have been there. It's, do you see the picture, friends? The two brothers give us an earthly orientation attitudes of this world that we wish we didn't have, but we have them. The Father, on the other hand, gives us a heavenly orientation. So let's turn to the Father, saving the best for last. The Father is able to be compassionate for the lost son. You know, he sees him in the distance. That passage can make me tear up easily. He sees him in the distance, and he is filled with pity for him. He sees a broken man, and his heart goes out to him in love. And notice that the father goes to the son, and not only does he go to him, he runs to his son. He doesn't ask for an apology. He, says, he doesn't say, are you going to do this again? <laughs> uh, the father, who has been generous, is, is gracious and generous again and extends honor and celebration to the son who has come home. He lavishes love on the prodigal son without any question. And then 
the obedient son, when he's outside, he hears the party going on, what did the father do? The father went out to him as well. He said, come in. He, he urges him um, uh, to come in and be with them. So um, the father is thankful for his sons and their being with him. And, you know, it's obvious that worldly possessions are secondary to him. He has gratitude for the very basics in life. Finally, the father expresses that there is joy in being with one another. And the practical son didn't see that. He only saw sheer obedience. But the father notes that we have one another, and that's what, is, that's what we take joy in, being together. Um, you know, I, these, these sidebars or these tangents always kill me, but... But I'm going to bore you with this one. But I remember one time when next door, and I was in Tennessee, and, and they had a house fire. And the kids, some of the kids were there, and they got loose. And, and then the parents got called home. And I, the picture will always be with me. But the father and the mom and the kids were all together. And the house was, was you know, of course, destroyed. But we have one another. And that's the picture with this father. I, I have you boys being with you. This is what it's all about. I love you and want to be with you. And that's what love and family mean. And that's what he's expressing. Um, well, in the two brothers and the father, we see some traits that we have experienced in our lives. These traits can also come and go as our attitudes change. And as we have trials each day, um, we have various spiritual forces that, that affect us. And we try to navigate through these uh, with the help of the Lord. So, like the prodigal son, we all experience the allure of this world. There are, are, are things we may want to do that may be truly sinful, or they just might be selfish. We just want our way. Uh, and like the prodigal son, we may have moments when we have that heart-to-heart -heart talk with ourselves. Um, perhaps in some moments when we're struggling, we're really honest with who we are and what we are. And, and I think in those moments, the voice of Jesus might come to us. When we're honest and open to who we are and who we should be, Jesus will talk to us and help us. Now, Let's switch over to the practical son. We can be dependable. We may follow the rules. We may be good examples. The practical son was never lost per se. He was with the father, but the practical son had severe troubles. He resented his father and his life of obligation. He resented his brother for squandering family money and getting his selfish ways. That, friends, is hard to change when we have these feelings of resentment. They're perhaps the hardest things to change. Unforgiveness and resentment. As a minister, I know that I've talked to people very old in life, sometimes near death, and they carry these things to their grave. So we come to the Father, our Father in heaven, and, and ask him to help us with these things. The Holy Spirit can work miracles in each of us. And the Father in our parable shows us the way. We can be like both of the sons, uh, but we can be like the Father sometimes. He shows us compassion and generosity. He shows us that being thankful and joyous in our sheer existence with the family of God is at the top of our list. Friends, it's all about love. You know, remember they had those bracelets of what would Jesus do? And you know, that's an ethical thing. If you think about what would Jesus do, and I'll do what Jesus does, you're following the rules. What this is all about is love. We do things out of love and not because that's the way it should be done. When we do things because the, the, of the way that it should be done, we can be filled with resentment 
and mire down in sin. We are Christians if we come to Christ for salvation. We are found. Yet we also can get lost very easily and unincluded. We can get lost like the prodigal son in a day or even a period of years. We can get lost and bitter like the practical and obedient son. But the Father shows us the way home, friends. We may have some home within us, and I think we do. When we're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. And the Father has blessed us with these gifts of compassion and gratitude and love, faith, hope, and love. It's planted in all of our hearts as, as believers in Christ. So we navigate to the way home. And that's what we're doing in our lives. My son, the Father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. Amen. Friends, our closing hymn is number three, is on page 329, there is power in the blood. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. May the Lord bless you and keep you, be gracious to you and grant you peace. Amen. Amen.